Hello, Leon. How are you doing? Hello, Howard. How are you? I'm fine. Uh, we were just talking about the virus and the police and the in the in the uh, and the very dangerous times that we're in. I guess uh, because of like you were saying, you know, the virus is challenging. Um, the human, the human, uh, uh, individual human experience. It's it's becoming. We're being collected into this, into this herd, aren't we? Well, I th I think the, we have to do uh, with the health. We have to do with the, the health, medico, pharmaco, industrial complex. There you go. And, and that, yeah, and that led us to the conversation about the police. Yeah. And the military industrial complex that's going yeah. on. And, you know, anyone who is sort of uh, not agreeing with kneeling and the wearing masks is, is considered a conspiracy theorist. And that is the interesting thing that you know, there is now in this, when I grew up in the 60s and 70s, there was a lot of uh, a contrary debate. Whether you were right or left, uh, there was a lot of debate and you didn't agree, but you agreed to disagree. And that's democracy. Yeah. And now you are only supposed to follow one uh, one scenario uh, and kneel down and wear the mask and damage your health and uh, and follow all the panic which is being spread. Yeah. And under cover of this, there's a gigantic financial reorganization of the world. Yeah. There's an enormous uh, health reorganization of the world. And we are going to be subjected in the future to these recurring panics which are and, and towards an uh, imposed... Um, uh, vaccinations which are crazy because they don't understand nature. You know, we are we live with viruses yeah. and our immune system has to be to be uh, uh, entertained and respected with good food and 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 and, and good air and uh, instead of smoking and being subjected to pollution and, and hassle and that is how we live with uh, with the viruses. The, the the Spanish flu, which is always given as an example, uh, happened because it was such an, an, a worldwide disaster because of First World War. People oh, right, right. They completely stripped barren uh, Belgium. You know. Well, <laughs> and, my, and, uh, yeah. my parents, they they were both uh, the children from well, I mean, comfortable families, and they were suffering hunger for four years. You know. Yeah, and uh, so that weakens the population, and and this panic is what is criminal. And I think it's interesting the parallel with architecture, because what happened to architecture since the Second World War is the abandonment of traditional modes of production of construction, with uh, extremely highly skilled uh, labor force, craft of craftsmen. And uh, was uh, transformed into an industrial production system where where people are really slaves. You know, the people who work on industrial sites they are they have nothing to dream about uh, as far as their work. Whereas when you have to do with craftsmen, they are like they are artists. They they enjoy their work and they are fantastically talented uh, in what they do because there's high competition and only the best survive. You know? Uh, now a worker is supposed to know nothing. I mean, he's introduced to to menial menial work on site, which has to obey strictly some protocol, and he's treated like an idiot. And these all this idiotic and and really inhuman work is going to be replaced or is underway to be replaced by robots. That's right. But robots are incredibly productive. Once they are online, they don't strike. They work day and night, no problem. And uh, the problem will be overproductivity, and and complete uh, uselessness of of people who have any skill with with uh, with their hands. But unfortunately, most people are skilled with their hands and their body, not with their brains. Very few people are, are gifted for theory, mm -hmm. uh, you know, right? Mathematics or abstract science. But enormous amount of people are gifted to do things with their hands and, and with their body. And uh, I mean, music wouldn't be possible without that. If you see anyone playing the violin or the piano, you wonder, how is it possible that a human can do this? You know, how is it possible to play at such a speed, so many notes, all by heart? Yeah. Because that is what human talent is permanent. Yeah. Is permanently born, and thanks God, modernism hasn't yet 
uh, damage that system of reproduction. But it, it looks like they're about to do that. <laughs> That's how I feel about ballet. When I watch a uh, ballet and I yep. watch the same ballet over and over, it's how do you remember all of these moves for that long to be so beautiful? It's, it's, it's extraordinary. Human, you know, human intelligence and talent are partial. And that is the lesson of life, at least what I learned in 50 years of being conscious or 60 years of thinking, yeah. is that humans are partially talented in one thing and partially intelligent in the other. Very few people are good at mathematics and at the same time being surgeons and uh, uh, running, running, uh, sprinting Olympic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. Uh, yes. So, and, it is, and that is the basis for collective why we need society, because we need each other. And in a way, the, the traditional craft society, which since Persia was um, a world empire, <laughs> yeah. has been trained to unbelievable skill, to unbelievable quality of architecture, which we still admire, independent of religion or ideology. And that is what is being lost. Because now architecture has been turned into kind of this good and bad. There's something you can do and yeah. others we can't. Yeah. And, and and there's no conversation. As you, you discussed that earlier, you said in the 70s, you felt like there was a better conversation um, in, 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 in our architect design culture than obviously today. Well, anyone who was, because it was really after 30 years, the first 30 years of industrial experience, the results were so bad around the world. Oh, oh collect, you got, yes, you could see, feel. Industrial building, uh, social so-called social housing, which I call anti-social housing, anti-society anti housing, you know, yeah. uh, was so bad that everyone agreed there needs to be change. So anyone who thought that architecture needs to be an aesthetic culture, not just uh, a technical industrial culture, uh, were friends. You know, I was friends with, I was asked to teach by Eliad Zangelis, who was Ram Kolas, his master, and Kolas and me who were friends. Uh, uh, I worked for Sterling on terrible projects, which <laughs> for a while, and and even Sterling changed. He agreed that you know, the, that we cannot go on. And but then when uh, Mitterrand, I think I must have uh, said this before, when Mitterrand reinstated modernism as a state regime architecture, everyone said Mitterrand, Mitterrand. Look at Mitterrand; he's our model. Yeah. Uh, and then the Prince of Wales took took sides on the other side for traditional architecture. And it is this polarization which then divided also the, the profession again, because in a profession, you know, imagine musicians can't play anymore the piano. What do you do? The whole literature, piano literature is now historic. You can only study this in the history class, not as music, not as sound, but as abstract notes in books and footnotes. And, and so you cannot just say, oh, I disagree with what I've been doing now for 30 years. Terrible. Uh, we have to change. But then maybe you don't have the talent. And most architects who were famous at the time, they had no clue about architecture. And so do most of star architects today, except uh, Robert Stern, know anything about classical architecture. I remember Douglas Stephen, who was a famous English architect, who was a master of uh, Kent Frampton and uh, even Sterling worked for him. He was an important man. He always called me the, uh, very affectionately the fascist, and I called him the communist. He came from a very big, wealthy family, so he was communist. <laughs> but he said he tried to do one classical building, but had to throw it away because it was miserable. It's not easy. Yeah, it's a craft. <laughs> and, and it's not easy in the way you're talking about, too, of the construction technology today. Exactly. It's, it's, it, how do you make an honest building with with the correct proportion scale and material with the misaligned construction technology yeah and, yeah. and also for the you know because now when you look and that is the interesting thing now with uh, very developed uh, digital culture we have people who are very skilled in drawing classical orders on the on the computer mm -hmm. Or you have programs which allow you to do perfect Corinthian column. I don't know what the ICAA have, have done this, but you find 
fantastic material now already ready to be used. I mean, like clones, tak, tak, tak. Mm -hmm. And you can even, as an ignorant, you can actually compose <laughs> a building which looks like, oh, it is really skilled. But then when you look in detail, it needs a bit more. Yeah, right. Like, more yeah. We, we were talking... Oh, oh sorry. That, that is the problem, that you can now, for instance, the castle in Berlin, they just completed the dome last week. It was yeah. sensational. Yeah. They lifted the lantern onto the dome, and there were about 10 people standing there, looking. It was a sensational thing, no music, no politician. It was done as if they were ashamed of it. But in Dresden, on the contrary, whenever they do something for the, when they rebuilt the Frauenkirche or the square, any building finished in the square was always accompanied with the large popular festivities, yeah. <laughs> like 70,000 people applauding, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Against the administration. And no, that, that now you can do that actually without even without uh, the craft skill, because most of the castle of Berlin was produced by robots in a, in a quarry near Dresden. And the craftsmen, they are just on site to finish the surface, you know, unify the surface. And that is really where, where we don't know where to go, because to rebuild a craft culture so that people who are involved in building uh, are happy with their work, love their work, can show it to their family uh, and, and even make a decent living with it. That is, there is no real plan B, how to reconstruct uh, the world, you know, in, in a human, human way. Well, well, do you find, and, and we were going to talk about Poundbury today, do, do you find, are you, are you pleased with the craftsmanship and the quality that's coming out of, of Poundbury, which, which is an incredible story that I don't think, that I know is in, you know, almost every, every book is reference to it, um, but have you, is there a book on Poundbury that tells the history that you've been a, a part of? Not, not yet, uh, because the, the Duchy of Cornwall, who are the prince's organization, they were not really keen to do it. There are now films. There was a fantastic film done on the Duchy of Cornwall, uh, anniversary 40 years with the prince, or 30 okay. years with the prince, I forget. But uh, with enormous, showing the enormous quality of which he has been realized in many projects. And those films, four films, have disappeared from YouTube. Huh. I thought if these stay on for more than a few weeks, it will turn all Republican. They, in, 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 in England, the anti-monarchists are called Republicans. It uh -huh. will turn Republicans into monarchists because he's, he's a good man. I mean, <laughs> and, and, do, and do you find the craftsmanship and quality of Poundbury good? Well, Poundbury, the, we had, you know, we, thanks God, when we started, we could rely on, we had, we only chose very small builders who had up to 10 to 15 people and uh, who had already experience in building traditional cottages mm -hmm. uh, of which there is a flourishing industry uh, in England was never really dead. It died, you know, it had the kind of slow death in the 70s, 60s and 70s. But thanks to wealthy, wealthy uh, landers, yeah. they often build on their own land. Even if they built skyscrapers for themselves, they built yeah, <laughs> classical pavilions and country houses at home. Yes, somebody of the McAlpine family was one of the biggest constructors and developers in England. Had his house built by by Quinn and Terry, class is nineteen seventy. You no, know. yeah. Um, so it survived, and because the prince, when the prince started to support this, and then Margaret Thatcher, she cancelled social housing as a state project. But she invested, she rather invested that money, which went into state projects or large development corporations like Roncon or uh, uh, Milton Keynes. She had those funds, <coughs> in uh, state funds, tax money invested in associations, small associations, which would op operate locally. And because even though she cancelled social housing as a as a so socialist scheme, uh, it was still maintained in the country. Very few people know that. And we have to build by law in Palmbury. We used to have to build 35, 25%, now 35% of social housing mm -hmm. 
in our developments yeah. are virtually a third, over a third, are now social housing. Yeah. Uh, just for reference, most most uh, uh, American large cities have to build 10 percent inclusionary housing on site. So yeah. sorry. But but those sites generally, as was with uh, so socialist social housing, anti-social housing, <laughs> in France, in Italy, everywhere, they were always parked in large zones, single-use zones. Huh? So there's a stigma to live yeah. in these in these things. Huh? Yes, and right. uh, uh, often uh, technically inferior and so on. What we decided was to have, of course. We are not against social house, social houses, we call them. Uh, but we want modest income and young people to live within the town and find jobs within the town, which they actually do, which is extraordinary. Is that the, 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 the houses are not distinguished from others. We, they have the same technical uh, performance than other buildings and aesthetic uh, aspect. And they are just as good as, as private privately developed terms. Huh? Yeah. And so there is not this stigma. And we, over now 30 years that we have been building, we, I think we had one or two problems with residents uh, because of that. Uh, because mixing income is not a problem. If you don't do that, the natural thing is that people are going to impose zoning, you know, income zoning. And in America, the problem is the, the income zoning with the gated communities, where it doesn't matter whether you are black or white or yellow, if you make a, a, a million per year, nobody cares. Right. Um, if you send your children to the same school and you go shopping to the same malls. And uh, so the, the important thing is not to force an integration, but allow it to happen and do yeah. not forbid it. Right. Do not forbid the integration. Right. Because naturally, there can be if you manage it carefully, and it's more work. And that is why initially it's more work to manage a scheme like that than when large landowners, like in England, this is the case. Most developments in the country are done by large landowners who sell a piece of land to a developer of houses, malls, hospitals, factories, uh, yeah. Yeah. parks. Yeah. And so you will never have mixed use. Mm -hmm. So the prince wanted a master plan which mixes uses. I mean, he was very conscious of it. He chose me because I was the only one. I did not con convert him to anything. He already knew the stuff. And he wanted me because there was very, very few candidates <laughs> to design that <laughs> at the time. Yeah. Right. Uh, but what uh, time was that? When was that? When was the conversation with the prince and you be began about town? I got involved, uh, actually, um, uh, John Simpson, the classical architect, mm -hmm. who was at the University of Notre Dame School, is a brilliant planner mm -hmm. and architect. He organized an exhibition in 1987, mm -hmm. uh, early 87, called Real Architecture. Mm -hmm. to contrast it with abstract architecture. And you had in that exhibition people like Quinlan Terry and um, uh, Robert Adam and uh, yeah. Dimitri Porfirios and myself. And, uh, <clears throat> and I had, was in the building center in London, uh, which is an, 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 a central organization there, but there are important exhibitions. And uh, the Prince opened the exhibition. And I didn't know him. I was never a royalist before. I couldn't care about, about his wife and all the stories about yeah. him. Yeah. But I, I remember being very impressed by his speech uh, for the architects, which was 1984, three years before. Mm -hmm. We already knew that he was sympathizing, and I had sent him my plan for Washington. <laughs> oh. And he had thanked, you know, very, very kindly. He's a very friendly person. So when he came, I had... Uh, in the exhibition, uh, a project for Spitalfields, which is part of the city, yeah. just next to the city, was an enormously important project. Yeah. But for the largest uh, developer in London, Stuart Lipton. And uh, we were in competition with another developer. But the other developer, instead of building 200,000 square meters, as was required by law and limited by, by the regulations, 
this other developer, London Edinburgh, with um, an actor called, I forget his name, but he was very famous then. Uh, he offered 400,000 square meters. Yeah. <laughs> so when we saw the planner, the chief planner of this borough, yeah. Tower Hamlets it's called, yeah. uh, who was typical socialist, you know, with roll, roller collar and so on. Um, and uh, he, I said, you know, I only accepted this job because it's mixed use and because there's a limit of 200,000 square meters, which allows me to build a three to four story high building fabric next to the skyscrapers of the city, <laughs> next to Liverpool Street Station. Right, yeah. And he was like very cool, you know, very distant. He didn't want to sympathize or show any interest in this scheme. So I said, finally, uh, we were there with Stuart and uh, another big, uh, one of his partners, and they said, so what do you think? Uh, and he said, well, well, sir, um, it is architecture which will decide. So I said, you mean uh, it's not the square meters, but the architecture. It's not 200,000 as should be. But even if you like the architecture, you can have 400,000. He said it's, and he banged the, the table, he said, it's architecture is going to decide. To decide. I said, yes, I call that corruption. Because why do you need legislation if you let, because of so-called architecture, who knows what that is? Because for me, that's not architecture. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, it's confusing things. And it's, I think it's against the law. So uh, Stuart uh, held well, but then he, uh, you know, he, every day I had chauffeurs, big limousines with bankers and <laughs> money, <laughs> money people in front of my house waiting with chauffeurs saying, would you not add another two floors? I said, no, I'm afraid. <laughs> I'm a law-abiding citizen. <laughs> I only accepted this. Stuart promised he would find this for me. And it took him one year to find something I, I found acceptable. And I'm not going to, no, we are friends. Why should I, no, because of, but I rather stay friends and give up that job. And I then recommended uh, uh, Quinn and Terry, uh, who can go up to seven floors. I was still, I mean, now we do seven floors too. But. Yeah, right, right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> Your career. <laughs> That's no, it funny. Was, it was, and now it's going to come down because the collapse. Oh, the, yeah, yeah. Because the corruption. The corruption today in our countries, in Italy, it's open. And if you don't behave, they just shoot you. <laughs> uh, but in England or in the United States, everything is done by lawyers. And the corruption is procedural with some kind of sinister footnote, something which was allowed here and there. It's just like the justice system, which has nothing to do anymore with justice. Yeah. I mean, the caricature. And, and, and we should call that corruption. I think that buildings, skyscrapers, and uh, suburbia sprawl is corruption. Yeah. It's against the Constitution. It's against society. It's destroying society. It's unlivable without our imperial armies bringing in the oil <laughs> when the shale oil is yeah. gone bust. Yeah. It's, it's irresponsible. Yeah. And they have to read the classics. I mean, right. read Cicero or, or Aristotle, uh, Plato, they talk about these limits. You can't build... I mean, Aristotle is fantastic. Yeah. It's very practical. You can't build a ship 500 meters long or 1,500 feet long. I don't know how to call it. Now they do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, but that's... At what price, you know? Yeah. Right, right. Raping, but, raping societies. And then, uh, so getting back to Poundbury, when the, the prince said he wanted to do a true mixed-use um, uh, place, was, was the site already selected? Were you, was the site already in process and they brought you in? How did that happen? Yes. I was brought in because the prince was not happy with the scheme which had been done, which was a suburban scheme uh, with typical you know, an employment zone and housing and, and one's, one uh, uh, commercial center and so on. He really strongly disliked it, even though the architect who had done it, Willie Bertram, was a good architect. I mean, he was a classical architect who, who has done a lot of good work in, in, um, in Bath, but he had no clue about urbanism. So, 
And the prince, yes, at the exhibition of Spitalfields, when I forgot to go on that, uh, the prince came, looked at it, didn't even look at it, he knew it all by heart, and we had like uh, over half an hour talk, which was meant to take just one minute. Mm -hmm. And he asked me to, if I wanted to become his advisor, and so I saw him for a year and a half, just you know, in odd places at night, and so advising on this and that, and I, he asked me to do a scheme for St. Paul's. Um, no wow! But because I was an alternative scheme, a counter scheme to the competition, but I was intellectually working well, but I was in a terrible depression because of the um, because of the the spear, you know, aftermath, <laughs> the fallout from the well, spear. And it, that I remember the Spitalfields cartoon that was it's called the Spear Spiritafields when no. you were designed. Remember that? That was terrible. Really, I, I didn't even see that. Yeah. But no. But anyway, there was a real campaign, huh? like they do now. They call anyone an, a, a Nazi who doesn't agree with kneeling down or you know, things like that. I mean, these follies, this hysteria. But the architecture has been uh, visited by this hysteria now for thirty years, you know, forty years yeah. since the war, really. And uh, so the 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 Spitalfields scheme, I, I resigned. But then a year later, he called me. I was an advisor, but on and off. And then later, he called me uh, to take over Poundbury. And the man who was managing this this scheme who was very dainty, a businessman from the city. And you know, they had the offices on Trafalgar Square, but he visited every day the. Um, the London Stock Exchange with his chauffeur managing his wealth. And um, so the, he was rather incredibly arrogant. He looked like Dr. Spock from uh, Star Wars. No, no, Star, the, Wars. Star Trek. Star, Star Trek. Star, he looked exactly like that. And I thought it was a joke. But, uh, <laughs> but, but anyway, when we first met with the prince, um, the prince said, Well, Leon is now going to do the master plan. And then uh, Christopher Jonas said, well, sir, yes, we'll, we'll take on board. We'll try to take on board what Mr. Creer says. And the prince banged the table and said, you are not going to take on board, you are going to do and follow exactly what, what Leon tells you. Wow. Wow. So I was really uh, put in charge. And then it took four, five years before we started the first, you know, the first building site. Because it became like a national national torment. Everyone had an opinion about Poundbury even before we scratched the ground. Yes. And particularly the Duchy of Cornwall, the prince's organization, they were just lying. They they didn't want to do it. They made more money by selling land. They thought mm -hmm. they thought they made more money by selling land than by managing the project. In fact, by going this way, the prince made enormous amount of money much more than he would have done if he had sold in 1988 to the city to some big corporation. You know? Right. And uh, so it's because, you know, organizations, uh, institutions or quasi-institutions like the Duchy of Cornwall, they are very, <coughs> they are establishment. And once they have a system which works well, they don't want to, to change it because it seems to be, you know, get to know new people, they listen to experts they never heard of, and so on. But certainly the prince disciplined them, and we started. I, won, I was in and out of the job. It was a cliffhanger for me for, for <laughs> three years. And, and only then when, um, uh, but the prince wanted to persist, um, we had even to meet sec secretly away from the Duchy of Cornwall. <laughs> And because of the major engineer, Alan Baxter, who has one of the next to over Arab, they have the biggest engineering office in London, right. who said, of course, Leo's scheme is viable, not only viable, it's exactly what you want to do. And then we stopped it. Yeah. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> but then the thing was that initially I wanted really the first phase to build, to be the first quarter to build middle farm. It was called, it was more like a village. Where we, with some shops and, and enough employment to employ 300 employments to employ people of the 300 houses. And um, the principles were more or less followed, but the, you know, initially I had designed far too large houses mm -hmm. because I measured the lots in villages and 
actually the traditional cottages, they are enormous compared to modern, modern developers' houses. They mm. have 60 feet frontages. Mm. Whereas the normal wimpy homes at the time, they had maybe, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> right. 15 feet was a big house. Uh, so I had several times to really study the market and what are the sizes to, at least that we would do comparable sizes. And then we went on, thanks God, we had really uh, uh, support in the local council by the, the town architect called David Oliver. Mm -hmm. Great man. He was, um, when, when, we went, when I was first sent out to Dorchester, you know, which is three hours from London, to meet with the local the local authority and the chief ar and the architect of the of the county, uh, drivers Jonas, the, the you know the the management company who did all the PR and all this non useless expensive nonsense for modern developments, they presented me. There were like 20, 20 minutes introductions of diverse people who talked about me and so on. And it's all BS, I mean, useless stuff and nothing, no content. But I looked at the architect who was sitting across the table and we knew immediately we are going to work together. No bullshit. <laughs> and when I rolled out my, my drawings, which the others had been extremely careful, you know, we, we have to understand this and that, and ecology, I don't know, all this crap. He looked at the drawings and he said, we are going to do exactly <laughs> what you are drawing. The only thing was we had to come back on a bit on the sizes of the lots. Uh, instead of having 200,000, we had 300,000, things like that. And uh, also the, the number of carriages were, were remarkable. So, but that was no problem. You know, there were technical problems. If I get the right info, I, I feed it in. I'm not, I'm not an ideologue. Whatever we, whatever program we get, we can do something better with it, as you know. You know yeah, yeah. Out of an awful school, just for ten thousand people, we can build a town. Yeah. Yeah? Instead yeah. of making a big monster machine where where people have no daylight and feel anonymous and uh, and ready to commit mass murder. <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel when you walk through Poundbury? Do you see your work and it's a work or do you actually get to experience it the way a, a, a person who hasn't been, you know, so ingrained in it? How do you experience, how do you feel when you walk through it? No, the, I mean, because every piece of land was, was worked and reworked and, uh, and particularly initially we didn't have the right kind of architects. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the Duchy, they didn't want, the Duchy of Cornwall, they didn't want, I wanted to employ mainly Abdel Wahad El Wakil, who is a genius, mm -hmm. who had a big office in London, he's the most gifted architect. Uh, they didn't want Quinlan Terry because he had the reputation of being a Christian revivalist, I don't know. I yeah. said, I don't care. Yeah. I absolutely don't care what people believe in their private. He's our best architect, let's get him. Yeah. Oh, wow. You know, he just builds for the rich. I said, we are the rich. <laughs> uh, he, does yeah. he does beautiful cottages. He would do good work, but they didn't want. Um, so Dimitri did one scheme and, and uh, I think they didn't pay him enough. I don't know. So he, he finally lost that job. And uh, so we had to work with what we got and mostly architects coming with the builders. But thanks God, David Oliver, the local architect, we became real close friends and I helped him and he helped me, you know, we, we designed a lot of stuff in the villages. Yeah. He told me and we discussed, I never signed anything, it was just for fun. And 99% of that stuff is built because he got jobs on his table from developers, which he didn't want to do, so we changed them and then they were built. And they were bloody good. Now with a few trees and a bit of ivy around, I mean, they are, you think they are part of the villages. Yeah, and so there was already a, an, a craft base, very good stone building because it's an area where there's a lot of stone. Mm. Herbeck, Portland, Portland, uh, famous Portland is twenty kilometers away from Poundbury, twenty five okay. kilometers. Oh, Herbeck, you know, fantastic quarries, and because we worked with local builders, they had already worked with architects who had done quite good jobs. There was particularly one called Ken Morgan, 
were done beautiful cottages, which I, even when I presented uh, the scheme to the public, I showed his, his cottages as models. This is the kind of quality you know in, you know, in the village in Abbotsbury and so on, you have them already. And we want that quality for the first phase. Then the later phase will be a bit more ambitious, more bath-like. You know? mm -hmm. The main square will be classical because it's... Uh, but that will be 20 years away. <laughs> Is the Queen's Tower built or under construction? No, no, it's finished, yes. It's finished. It was finished three years ago. Three years ago. I guess I haven't... I've only seen the drawings. I guess I still haven't seen an image. Um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, because there was... Uh, you know, the main thing was to get a mixed use because that goes against the, the, generally the, the, the local plan. They are not used while well, they don't want to mix things with uh, shops and you know, that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. In the oh, industry. We don't, find, we don't find, we don't find, you know, Sainsbury don't want to come in here. I said, we don't want Sainsbury. You know, we want small, small family type businesses. Well, and we need low rents for shops because what's the point in having social housing if you don't have social rents for shops so that people can start the business and then after four years you you ask them to pay the real real rents well you, and you rebuilt you built one of the first new pubs after all the pubs in england were being closed you the yes. poet laureate is the one of the first yes. one of the rare new ones and that was interesting because it was won the competition was won by ben pantries who was still a student at the yeah. Prince's, Prince's he's Institute. A, he's very talented, yeah. Well, he, he then, Ben went after that uh, to, to America, worked for, with uh, Simmons and, and, and Fairfax. Yeah. He became friends with Marianne Cusato, and we, we did this book together on Get Your House Your Right. Your House Right, yeah. I worked with Ben when he met Marianne at the uh, Hurricane Katrina charrette that Andres put together. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Ben and I were a team. It was great. Right. Fantastic, yeah, yeah. 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 And, and then, uh, in a, the on and off, we, it was, I needed to do a lot of correction in the first phase, first two, three, four phases, because you know, the architects were not used to do the real thing. They were used to do caricatures, always the chimneys are too thin, uh, the, the windows are too big, or, or, or they are not divided, and, or the, the, the pillars, the entrance pillars, yeah. the garden walls, everything is too thin and too, too frail. So to get the right dimension, I always remember, around every chimney, and chimneys were obligatory. Every house had to have a chimney, even if you don't have a fireplace. I don't care about whether it's a real fireplace or not, because you can't win everything. So at least get a chimney, because it will always be useful sooner or later. <laughs> but they were always too small. So I always wrote on the chimneys 200% more. No. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And, but finally, when we got decent architects, um, uh, finally we involved uh, Fairfax and Simmons with Ben, were, were then involved in doing a, a major crescent, you know, like about 10 buildings around the major crescent. And they were so well done that then we employed Ben, became one more important. And, uh, and finally, uh, he was, but he was still on the margin. There were so many mistakes made by builders. I mean, there was one phase which had gone to, we unfortunately sold against the prince's will. The duchy sent, sold the land, like two blocks to one big, uh, big developer, which we normally wouldn't do, and it was disaster. Mm. Mm. They fired the architect without telling me. The architect was fantastic, John Smythe, Peter John Smythe, a fantastic architect. He had done beautiful detail. And then when, when I saw this garbage being built, I took the prince to the detail and I said, you know, if, if you go on doing this, I, I have to resign. It's not good enough. We yeah. can now be accused of doing Disneyland because look at these corbels. Look at this. I mean, it's disgusting. Yes. It's fake and it's not even good fake because if you do fake, at least make it the right proportion, make it seem as if it was real. But this looked really fake. Yeah. So, so I said, you know, if we are constrained by large builders like these to do fake traditional architecture, we need all the more, uh, more gifted and capable architects. Because to do a fake correctly, so it seems correct, is much more <laughs> difficult than doing it. <laughs> when, you, when you use traditional craft, yeah. They can get it wrong, it never looks wrong. 
They yes. can. Yeah. They may not follow your drawings, but it doesn't look wrong. Uh, yeah, I think that's the issue we've talked about before, where the, the technology, the, the construction technology is so mismatched today that it takes great, great, great design to make yeah. it feel good. I always say it's like, you know, I'm a director, a theater director, I'm invited to Moscow, uh, nobody speaks English, and we have to do with that troop of fantastically talented voices and actors uh, we have to do Shakespeare in original English text. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's the kind of situation we are in. And then people complain, oh, it's not all, you can see it's not very serious. No, for every built mistake, I always say, for every built mistake, we have about 10 correct drawings. <laughs> well, one of the successes of Poundberry is, in my opinion, all of the new the, the Cornwall development, the other the other villages, the other uh, the, the, the 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 more of it rather than it yes. being isolated. Well, I think that's its greatest success because our builders who started with with five ten builders with five ten employees, they have now the the most important one um, has now uh, Philip Philip Fry. He has grown to be even on the stock market. I mean, they, they built everywhere, in, uh, all over England. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, for instance, when the big crisis, 2008, I think you have to watch time. Yeah? Oh, we're okay right now. Yeah, you're right. But let, we could, yeah, let, you're right. Yeah. We'll, but uh, keep, go ahead, keep the story. 2008. Uh, 2008, uh, we had um, one uh, national house builder, I forget the name, Bartlett's, Bartlett's. Yeah. They were meant to be to do our King King Point, which is the main was the secondary most important building on the on the uh, Queen Mother's Square, which is the center of the center. It's a central square of the central quarter. No, it's a central square between three quarters. It's really yes. it really works. Yes, uh, locationally and also functionally. And Queen and Terry was the architect. By then, Queen and Terry became acceptable. And suddenly, 2008, when the disaster happened, uh, the man who was managing this job in London disappeared from his desk. No more telephone. Oh, Bartlett cut back their, their big operations in, in, in Poundbury and elsewhere. You know what happened? Our small builders got together and bought the site. And then finally, it was only one of the small builders who actually built this huge building. Uh, so they grew, and that's the interesting thing, they grew with the, with the building site. And also one of the, the lessons of this is that you start with small builders, but what builders, they need to plan well ahead, three, four years ahead, so they can employ their workforce and grow, if they grow, in an ordered manner. And particularly because they have to train their workforce. There's yeah. no training colleges anymore. They yeah. train on site. That's right. Um, that they need to know what they do with their workforce. They cannot, when this crisis happened, like, like in America, send them all home. Yeah. <clears throat> and thanks God, our small builders had seen this coming. Not one of them had problems. That's uh, they slow down work, but they do not send their workforce home. To, and one of our problems is to get our our permits in time. You know, the architects, George Somerset Smith and Ben Pantreeth, our main architects, are fantastic architects. They produce very professional drawings, really sharp. Uh, I almost have nothing, nothing to comment except say, great, <laughs> <laughs> more, of this, more of this, and, um, and tune a bit here and there, you know, this little higher, but just for fun. It's like tuning a perfect piano. What do you do? I mean, yeah. voice a little here and there. <laughs> so, but it's really fun. Huh? But uh, it's often to get the permit in time because, of course, bureaucracy, they look at these 500 drawings for 200 houses or, I don't know, 1,000 drawings, and they don't see how good it is. So they are pernickety. They look, oh, look at this drain pipe. is not in the right position. Bullshit. I mean, it's just self-employed. Yeah. We don't need these people. No. 
the bureaucracy, when you have a capable workforce, you need one person in a, in a, in a bureaucracy supervising the construction of a town or a village. You don't need bureaucracy. Now, somebody like, like David Oliver, he didn't need anyone around him to, to say how to improve uh, or how to give, give a building permit. And he gave building permits only once they had corrected their damn drawings. But he was not, he was not uh, uh, you know, torturing people. He just did it to get the right kind of architecture, which fits right into the Dorset vernacular, which is famous yeah. and beloved by everyone. You know? yeah. So those are the experiences which, which happen. And it's, we, we just planned, uh, it's, we just finished the plans for the last quarter, which is going to be submitted imminently. I hope to do finally one building the way I want to do it. I want uh, to plan myself. Well, I, I, I hope so too. That would be... <laughs> but so far, my only really signable building is the... Is the, the, is the tower. No, for Queen Mother. No, they didn't build my, my, my tower. There was oh. a huge plot. Oh, oh, okay. Well, then that's part of my confusion, I, I hope. Uh, um, but so my... you would think, though, you would earn at least one building uh, on, your, of, of your, on your merits. It was really dishonorable. There was a real plot, a uh, Dutch internal plot to get me out of that job. They didn't want the master planner to, to design because they thought I had already too much prominence. Too much. But my only honor was left was that I could appoint the architect because somebody else wanted to grab that job and I made sure that he wouldn't get it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so I yeah. gave it to Ben. Who is uh, our... <laughs> I'll, I'll make sure that we I include Ben when we put this out, uh, they get uh, Ben connected because we, we see each other on social media. Uh, he's very talented. Well, any thank you very much for the discussion. Any final thoughts on Poundberry though? How, how, what's, what, anything, what, what do you think about when you think of Poundberry today? Right well, now, are you worried about it? Are you comfortable no, with it? No, no, as long as Prince Charles is, is controlling it, it's fine. Uh, what I fear is once they, uh, once he becomes king or once they sell it or something happens, the, the continuity, because you know, the overwhelming forces to do the wrong thing yeah. is overwhelming. I yes. mean, uh, but in England, there's now a lot of reaction, particularly the, you know, the Beauty Commission, the commission which was created by by last government to uh, supervise, so that building development should be beautiful, so people don't protest because they think development is bad because architecture is bad, because people generally are not against building if it's nice. Yeah. And Roger Scruton, who had become the head of that commission, unfortunately died. But there are now many. I think also maybe hopefully the crisis, this idiotic, absurd, fabricated crisis. Uh, uh, will will slow down things. It will expand the monopolistic sector, but it may also, for instance, in Germany, I, I find very interesting. There are finally people who were extremely critical, fantastic journalists who were supposed to be on the left. They say, generally, I'm no longer on the left. The left has become too stupid. No. Uh, we, need, we need to be, uh, to create uh, a new kind of politics who debate again, right? Because there's no right. The right is no way. I'm not going to say. I, I hear what you're saying, but the right has become quite violent, in my opinion. It's become the militarized, but and the there left. is in the left. So there is no there. It's this. There's no debate. No, there's no debate. If you don't agree with them, they they are they are uh, calling you an anti-Semite or a racist or whatever. Right. Yeah. But no, it's, it's fashionable or yeah. climate denier. You know. Yeah, yeah, but but then the other side wants to own you. That's the thing. They want to own the libs. Well, that's that's violence. That's not good either. Yeah, Where because, are how, how do we have debate? How do we do this? Well, What's, there's a very interesting German uh, a doctor who was famous famous doctor in Germany, who has become very vocal in these protests now against COVID, you know, lockdown, which is basically. Uh, damaging uh, people's health. No? And he created a new party, and he said in a, in many, something really interesting, uh, that have you looked at people debating in the parliament? Once the government talks, the opposition sits there doing their emails. Once the opposition talks, the government sits there doing their emails. They don't listen. They don't care. They don't care to debate. 
and he mentions a famous uh, tradition in American Indian uh, politics before before uh, the American before the European before Columbus uh, that when you had an opposite party when you had an opposite debate you who were talking had the stick and the one who hold the stick can say what he wants and then when he hands the stick to his opponent the opponent has to repeat exactly word by word what his opponent said before him so he listens he listened yeah. and out yeah. of his confrontation of opinions you then get maybe something uh, a compromise within which is intelligent instead of criminal and corrupt that the ancient Hawaiian, and it's even creeped in today. They have, they have. If there's an, if there's a problem in the village, in the town or the village, they go to a a house and they sit and they eat, and they have to talk to each other. They and they have a mediator who says, "Are you hearing this? Are you there?" And they force each other to listen and yeah. talk. And okay, that's so what that's we what have we have to do. <laughs> well, we can end with that at fifty at fifty minutes. Um, but I don't want to end talking right now. I'm just going to stop the recording. Thank you, Leon. Thank you.